Our scripture reading is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 13. Now considering the things that are offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up and love edifies. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know, but if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Therefore, considering the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and there is no other God but one. But even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there are many gods and many lords, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom all things, and we for Him, and one Lord Jesus, through whom all things, and through whom we live. However, there is not in everyone the knowledge, for some with consciousness of idols, eat until now, eat, eat it as a diff- thing different to an idol. And their conscience being weak is defiled. But food does not commend us to God, for neither if we eat are we better, nor if we do not eat are we the worse. But beware lest someone, somehow this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idle simple, and wit will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things Offered to idols. And because of your knowledge, shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes your brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. My sermon is entitled, The Cultivation of a Christian Conscience. The text is taken from 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 12 in the Revised Standard Version. Thus sin against your brethren, and wounding their conscience, when it is weak, you sin against Christ. We've often heard people say, I will always follow my conscience. If you follow your conscience, you will never, never go wrong. Is this necessarily so? The Wilder Conference needs careful definition and proper understanding. Some consider consider their conscience to be the voice of God within, which will guide them unerringly To do that which is right. These people are disillusioned when they later discover that they have been wrong or have done that which is harmful to themselves and to someone else. Conscience has been defined as God given oughtness. Conscience is an inward conviction, there is such a thing as right and wrong. People have an inborn sense of oughtness. This inborn sense of obligation to do what is right and to avoid what is wrong is a common possession of Christians and non-Christians alike. The Bible speaks of many different kinds of conscience. One can have a weak conscience, a good conscience, a pure conscience and an uneasy conscience, or a guilty conscience. The conscience also can be ignorant. Paul confesses that he persecuted the church without any qualms of conscience. Acts 26, verses 9 through 12. Acts 26, 9 through 12. Indeed, I myself thought... I first must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus Christ. This also I did in Jerusalem, 
and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests when they were put to death. I cast my vote against them. I punish them often in every synagogue and compel them to blaspheme and being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them. Paul speaks of those who had a seared conscience in 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. The former verse says he was had a conscience, but that conscience was wrong. It caused him to kill many, many saints. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, he talks about the, scare, the seared conscience. 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits, and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. He also speaks of a defiled conscience in Titus chapter 1 verse 15. To the pure, all things are pure. To those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience are defiled. These passages of scripture and these illustrations demonstrate that the conscience cannot always be treated as if it were the one and only voice of God within. First of all, the contents of the conscience. We need to recognize that the contents of our conscience is a result of education we have and the decisions we have made concerning the right conduct. First, the teaching from parents be it good or bad, forms a part of the content of one's conscience. Secondly, the customs of the community form a part of the content. Third, the thoughts, habits, and ideals have one's peer group form a part of one's conscience. When we were growing up, if you were a girl, you followed the peers. You lifted your skirts. That was the community you grew up in and you were under peer pressure and certainly it affected your conscience. Fourthly, the content of one's conscience can be formed by books read, television programs, and films watched and listened to. This is all part of your conscience. What you are reading, what you are watching, this becomes a part of you. We need to recognize that one's conscience is not an inerrant guide. First of all, one can be taught mis mistaught by parents or teachers. We have a lot of misinformation given to us and put in our heads by our teachers that determines our conscience. One can choose a peer group whose ideals and philosophy are directly opposite to that which is good for the individual or community. Thirdly, one can come to a faulty conclusion as a result of thinking that is not straight and fully informed. Secondly, the authority of conscience. While the conscience may not be inerrant, one is wise to follow the direction of his or her best conscience. Not to do so will create a guilty conscience. Not to do so is to deprive, deprive oneself of a better conscience. Thirdly, a conscience that is not continually violated will cause one to lose a sense of God's presence. God is always present. 
Our conscience needs to be fully engaged with God's conscience. Only when the conscience is filled with the mind of Jesus Christ and led by the Holy Spirit can we have the assurance we're hearing the voice of God within. Thirdly, guidelines for the Christian conscience. In seeking to do what is right and to know what is the highest and the best, we should ask ourselves several questions. Questions concerning the effect of our course of conduct. First of all, what effect will it have on me personally? Both short term and long term. Let conscience be your guide. If it's the wrong guide, you're going to go the wrong way. If it's the right guide, you will go on the paths of righteousness. What effect will my conscience have on others? It could have a detrimental effect if it's wrong. What effect will this have on the cause of Christ? If your conscience is not aligned with Christ, you will have a detrimental effect on the cause of Jesus Christ. You will say the wrong thing at the wrong time. You will not be led by the Spirit of God. What effect will this have on the non-Christian? Four tests concerning the moral decisions you face. First of all, this test of secrecy. Do you want to keep this a secret? If so, it is doubtful. If you're keeping a secret and you're not able to allow others to see it, certainly it's not the right conscience. The test of publicity. Would you be willing for the public to learn fully of your decision at this point? Are you afraid? Are you scared that the public will find out what you are thinking? Thirdly, the test of universality. Would the entire community be uplifted if each person arrived at the same decision? And fourthly, the test of prayer. Can you truly add God's blessing on the decision that you make? The course of your conduct. Would you be afraid of publicity? Would you be afraid of secrecy? Do you ask God's blessing on the decision and the course of your conduct. Fourthly, cultivating the right Christian conscience. We must, must, we must not assume that a conscience is fully Christian merely because we have trusted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. The Christian life should be looked upon as a journey from the mind of the flesh to the mind of the Spirit. We should seek daily to be more like Jesus, Christ to be in thought and conduct. The conscience must be ethically educated and disciplined by the renewal of our mind. So says Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies... A living sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to the world, the peer pressures, the wrong things that your parents have taught you, the wrong things that the educational system has taught you. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that which is acceptable and good and perfect will of God. Our conscience should always be subject to the will of God for our life and for the life of others. Instead of merely following the dictates of our conscience, 
we should seek to know the will of our loving God. We should walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5, verse 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit. Our daily walk should be one of faith in the leadership of our Lord and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. We should let the Spirit dictate our thinking and determine our attitudes and decisions. We can develop a Christian conscience by studying the Word of God, by memorizing certain scriptures so that our conscience will not lead us in the wrong direction. The Bible says there is a way that seems right to a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of sin. Your conscience, if not educated by the will of God, by the scriptures, can lead you astray. Do you have a guilty conscience that accuses you of some evil, some failure, some shortcomings, some mistakes? Congratulations if you do. There is hope for you if you follow the leadings of this conscience to make confession where possible and restitution. A conscience that hurts is indicative of the fact that your conscience is not corrupted and seared. A conscience that hurts is God's way of telling you that He wants to help you and that He will help you. God's Spirit will re-educate your conscience to do the right thing at the right time, at the right place, to the right people that you come in contact with. Recognize a guilty conscience is God's call to a nobler way of life. A guilty and educated conscience that tells you what is right and what is wrong is a nobler way of life. It is not necessary that you continue to suffer from a guilty conscience. Come to the Father God in confession and repentance and experience His cleansing and His forgiving grace. The song, Let Conscience Be Your Guide, is not right. If it is done by the will of God, by His work, by His Holy Spirit, then you are following the right conscience. Let God's conscience be your guide.